here's where we are going in this chapter. Because this chapter can be kind of long and theoretical, and yet the equations we get out of it are, well, not very difficult. They're fairly small. You just have to know which one to use. So where are we going? Well, we're going to answer a couple of questions. We're going to answer the question of what is the most efficient heat engine that we could make, and what's the most efficient refrigerator or heat pump we could make, and what does the efficiency of those devices depend upon? So what's the best we could ever do, and what does it depend on? I remember being a kid, and my father was interested in something called the Pogue carburetor. It was supposed to be a carburetor you could build that some mechanic had invented, I believe, in Canada, and it would help your car get 200 miles per gallon. This was back in the 70s or, or so, maybe the early 80s. And, of course, you know, as usual, there were a lot of fantastical claims about this thing, and, you know, big oil was suppressing it and so forth. It's a valid question, though. What is the best that you could do? What's the maximum number of miles per gallon you can get? How, how much energy can you get out of a gallon of gasoline that you actually completely convert to pushing your car down the road? Obviously, in the first place, you have to be able to measure all those things. For example, to know how much energy there is in the gasoline in the first place, you got to understand the higher heating value and the lower heating value of the fuel and what that is and what that means. And the idea that when you take the fuel and you react it with oxygen, which is basically what you're going to do in the engine anyway, that the, the results are the same as they would be. It's, it's going to give the same amount of energy out in just burning as it will be able to give off in the car. The first thing to understand is that all of the energy in the fuel is going to be converted to thermal energy. So what we would normally call heat. And then that thermal energy is what drives the engine. And it's really restrictions on thermal energy conversion that we are interested in. The answers I'll go ahead and give you. A completely reversible heat engine, refrigerator or heat pump, whichever device you want to talk about, that's the one that would be the most efficient. And the efficiency of any of those devices depends on the, the two temperatures they're working across. If you think about an engine, for example, what is it doing? Well, it's taking in fuel, it's bringing that fuel to generate thermal energy. Well, whatever that maximum temperature is versus the temperature of the atmosphere, those are the temperature limits that it's working between. In the same way, heat pumps and air conditioners and, all, and refrigerators, all these devices are working between two temperatures. Your refrigerator, for example, is trying to maintain the interior temperature of the refrigerator or freezer versus the outdoor temperature. So it's working between the internal temperature of you know, where the food's at versus outside of the refrigerator where the food would go bad. So what we're going to do is start talking about entropy. And I thought I would include this. I found it online and really liked it. It says entropy, the ultimate thermodynamics game. You can't win. You can't break even. You can't even quit the game. So entropy is really what we're talking about here. It's what we're approaching. Before we get to the second law, let's talk a little bit about what you can observe in the real world. What actually happens. So, for example, we have this idea that energy is conserved, right? So that's the law of conservation of energy. It seems to be one of the most useful things we've ever figured out. And also, of course, being able to quantify various forms of energy is helpful too. But the idea that energy can't be created or destroyed is fundamental to many different things. And so let's see in all these cases whether or not the first law of thermodynamics, the law of conservation of energy, is violated or not. So if you have a vat of water and you stir a propeller in it real fast, in other words, you're, you're putting work into that water, you could expect eventually for the water to heat up and the heat to come out of the water. That would make sense. So the thermal energy of the water would increase, heat would be given off. And as long as the amount of work that flows in is equal to the heat that flows off, plus whatever is left behind in the water, the first law says this is fine. As a matter of fact, the first law, in a sense, is reversible because as far as it's concerned, you could put heat into the water and thereby turn the, the blades, right, and turn the shaft doing work and get work out of it. Now, in the real world, we know this doesn't happen, but the first law has no problem with this as long as the heat that flows in 
is equal to the sum of the work that flows out plus whatever is left behind in the water. So the first law is not even violated here. If we could make this work, well, we could do some useful things with it. After all, we could just put heat into water, make that heat turn some blades somehow, and raise a weight. That's literally doing work. So our machines, like you see on the right-hand side, could be very simple machines. Our cars, you know, could simply take in heat and be pushed down the road. But obviously, it's not quite that simple, is it? What about the first law, though? Well, the first law still has no problem with this. As long as the heat that flows into those blades is no more than the work done, the first law says everything is fine. How about if you set hot coffee out on your desk? Well, it's going to cool down. And obviously, the amount of energy in that coffee goes down as heat is evolved from it. So the amount of energy lost in the cup is equal to the the heat that leaves and that's no problem with the first law. So none of these violate energy conservation. What about reality though? In reality this doesn't happen. So in reality the first ter the first example could work, right? We could spin the water real fast because the water has some uh, viscosity certainly will heat up. Probably it'd be easier to observe this if we had bubble gum in there instead and we had something powerful enough to stir it around. Since bubble gum is very viscous, obviously, this could evolve a, a significant amount of heat and we could observe this pretty easily with the thermometer. We wouldn't have to have very sensitive instruments to measure temperature changes like we would with the water. So that could work just fine. That would be observed in real life. But the second one is not observed in real life. You can't just heat up water and it magically turn a turbine blade this way. You have to somehow pressurize the system. You have to plan it out. You have to control how the water flows. And you have to pressurize the water to make it work. So this simple example here doesn't work. We can't just put heat in and work magically come out. We have to very carefully plan our machines. And so building a machine with this idea simply will not work. It has to be more complicated than this. There's something we're missing here. And of course, the last case with coffee cooling down over time, we all know that happens. But notice the reverse doesn't happen. Notice that coffee doesn't just heat up on its own. In a sense, this is a process that is irreversible. The opposite does not happen. In fact, all of these are irreversible processes. The, the forward processes are the ones that work. The reverse are the ones that do not work. And so we say that to have a process happen, for it to be reality, the first law, energy conservation, and the second law have to both be satisfied. So processes only occur in one direction. They are not reversible. To understand what's going on here, we need the concept of a thermal energy reservoir. So you see Calvin and Hobbes sitting there watching TV. You know that energy is coming into the TV because it's plugged in. Did you know that the light coming off the front of the TV is a very small fraction of the energy that comes in from the wall? As a matter of fact, the bulk of the energy in these older TVs, and even in modern TVs, comes off as heat. Most of it is wasted in the sense that uh, the electricity, which you paid for, just turns into warming your room, and it's not very good at that. So, and obviously, in the summertime, you wouldn't want that anyway. In the wintertime, maybe you'd be okay with it, but it's not a very efficient way to heat your home. So, Calvin and Hobbes are sitting here, and the TV is giving off heat continuously, but do you notice that the temperature of the room does not change? So, the TV gives off heat, but there's no change in the air temperature, at least not much. Now, it, today, you might hear people talking about their their gaming computer in a small bedroom and that it, when they have it on, it heats up the room. They notice it because it's consuming so much power. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't have a high-powered computer. I suppose it would be possible. Obviously, if the computer is drawing a 1,000 watts or something, that would certainly be a pretty effective uh, heater. But most of the time, when we're talking about like electronic devices like your smartphone or even the, the laptop that I'm working on, they don't give off enough heat to change the air temperature in the room significantly, right, or even measurably. And so we could describe the air in the room as being a thermal energy reservoir. The idea behind a thermal energy reservoir is that it can give some thermal energy to whatever needs it, or it can accept thermal energy from pretty much anything and not change temperature. 
at all. And so things like the atmosphere, rivers, lakes, oceans, the ground, these are all essentially thermal energy reservoirs. In the ground you've got to go down pretty deep, but eventually you get to a point where the temperature doesn't change. Now, interestingly, the, the surface temperature and the temperature within the first you know, 200 foot of soil or so, I mean, less than that, probably 100 foot or so, have significant variation that are seasonal and actually very, uh, they're, they're a little bit behind the seasons. So there's a little bit of lag, which is interesting. But still, the ground could be considered in some sense a thermal energy reservoir as long as you get down far enough. So the whole idea of a thermal energy reservoir is that there's no change in temperature even if it's acting as a source and giving off heat or if it's acting as a sink and taking on heat. Power plants can be considered a heat engine because they work on thermal energy. They take thermal energy and convert it to work or at least a portion of it. They don't convert all of it. As a matter of fact, They'll take in energy in a boiler, for example, and this boiler could be nuclear fired, it could be coal fired, it could be solar powered. In the desert there are arrays of mirrors that shine light and concentrate the light on one area. That's the furnace. And what it's supposed to do, regardless of the particular technology, is basically boil water or boil some working fluid, change the phase of it, uh, and give it energy so that it can then do work. So this fluid typically as I said water in the boiler is already at a high pressure and so you add energy to it now you've got high pressure high temperature uh, working fluid really and typically you add enough heat or you transfer enough thermal energy into this the water so that it becomes steam it goes from the liquid phase to the vapor phase and so you got high pressure hot steam going from the boiler into the turbine, driving the turbine blades, producing a significant amount of work. Interestingly enough, what happens immediately after that, after you put all that energy into the liquid water to boil it off and run it through the turbine extracting work, the next thing you do is run it through a condenser and then remove all of that latent heat of vaporization from it and throw away a whole bunch of energy at the, the condenser and that's labeled Q out. We'll talk a little bit later about why this is and why it's actually a good idea although at first glance it looks like a very bad uh, intentionally evil idea and it isn't at all. Then the liquid water, the, the saturated liquid water leaves the condenser and goes back into the pump to be pumped back up to the boiler pressure and the cycle repeats. We can make this a little more abstract and consider thermal energy reservoirs as the high temperature source. You understand that obviously the furnace has to be fired by something, whether it's sunlight or coal or nuclear, whatever it is. Let's just talk about coal, for example. If we're firing the boiler with coal, we got to keep adding it in, right? So while you might think that the boilers or the, the furnace is not a good um, thermal energy reservoir, actually it is because we can maintain its temperature even though energy is being extracted from it. So our, our furnace, our high temperature source, is what transfers energy into the heat engine. A portion of that energy then is converted by the heat engine into work and then the remainder of that uh, energy goes into a low temperature sink and is simply thrown away. And often power plants will use the atmosphere or a nearby river or something like that as the low temperature sink. But understand that those low temperature sinks don't change their temperature appreciably by the amount of energy being put into them. Now these plants use working fluids. As a matter of fact, your car is a heat engine and it uses a working fluid as well. I'll let you think a little bit about what that working fluid might be. We'll talk about it later in the course. But for now, obviously the working fluid in this plant is water. So some general features of heat engines, and this is true of most heat engines, they receive heat from a high temperature source, basically a thermal uh, energy reservoir. They convert part of that heat into work, not all of it. They reject some waste heat to a low temperature sink, so another thermal energy reservoir at a different temperature than the, the high temperature reservoir. They operate on a cycle which is only practical. You wouldn't want to build an engine that gets you from your house to say your work and then have to replace the engine, right? You want it to be able to work over and over again. So the only question becomes how long is the cycle, right? Usually these heat engines use a working fluid. For all practical heat engines that I know of, they all use a working fluid. There are some uh, heat engines 
that do not use a working fluid, but I've never seen them do anything particularly useful. They're just more scientific um, inquiries or curiosities. Now, thinking about that power plant heat engine and not the heat flows as much, but now I'm thinking of the workflow, the work produced by the turbine can't be completely extracted and used. A portion of it has to go back to drive the uh, pump. So not all of the work that is produced is used. There is a net amount of work produced, and it's the difference between the power output of the, the turbine and the power input to the pump, or the, the work output of the turbine minus the work input to the pump. So we can draw an energy balance for the system where the system boundary is just the whole production plant. And you see that we have heat flowing in and out, we have work flowing in and out. And so if this is operating on a cycle, well, it's coming back to where it started. So the amount of energy in the box is not changing over a decent period of time. And so we can write the heat flows, Q in minus Q out, and then minus work out minus work in. I don't really like that. I wish this was just written. I probably should change it as Q in plus W in minus Q out minus W out. It's the same thing. But you'll notice that W out minus W in is the net work out. And so we can solve for it and say that the net work produced is equal to the difference in the heat flows. Another way of saying this is if it comes in as heat and doesn't come out as, as heat, it must leave as a net amount of work. Now to understand what the best is we could ever do with a heat engine or refrigerator or heat pump, to understand that limit, we have to define efficiency. We have to know what efficiency or performance is. And so we are going to define efficiency and performance as desired output over required input. So if you think about drag racing, what is what does performance mean in drag racing? Well, it's distance per time, right? You've got a certain set distance you have to go from here to the end of the track. And the less time it takes, the greater your performance. So it's just the ratio. Track racing where there are curves that have to be negotiated and perhaps other drivers, performance there is measured as speed per time. In other words, acceleration. If you think about track performance and how it works, you do want a big engine because you want to be able to accelerate in the forward direction as fast as you can, but also you need good brakes, right? You need powerful brakes because you want to come up to the curve as quickly as possible and use your brakes to slow down in just the minimum amount of time necessary to make it around the curve and then accelerate again with your, your big engine, right? But also you need good suspension so that, and good tires and so forth, so that as you go around the curve, your lateral accelerations can be high also. You don't want to have to crawl around the curves. You want to go around the curves as quickly as possible. So forward, back, right and left, or lateral and uh, you know forward and reverse acceleration are very important in track racing, and that's the metric of performance. It's not necessarily the fastest car out there that's going to win the race. It's the car that can get around the curves and not have to slow down that will probably win the race. As a matter of fact, this is so important that some uh, charts called GG plots are made by race teams and what they'll do is simply put an accelerometer in the car and as the driver drives around the track uh, the best that they can they will measure acceleration in the forward reverse right and left directions of course that's pretty simple because forward and reverse really is the same direction it's just one one's positive the other one's negative and then right and left you can decide which way, which side is positive and which is negative but the acceleration is measured in units of g's so you can easily understand it now looking at this actual um, GG plot, you'll notice that the accelerations are larger to the left, right? There, there's more acceleration on the left hand side. That's where the, the, the points go out the farthest. As a matter of fact, we get about uh, 1.2 G's to the left, and that's probably the, looks like that's the one of the farthest points out. Uh, it may be that the acceleration is pretty high over on the lower right side, but that's a combination of braking and turning right. So there's a lot of high acceleration. There's uh, you know a, a good distribution of accelerations to the left. On the right-hand side, for right-hand turns, it appears that there's a cluster over there of accelerations. Not extremely high, but also not particularly low. Now you might notice here that we've got circles representing acceleration in units of g's from the center zero g's you might notice that the forward acceleration is not all that great right our forward acceleration 
uh, only goes up to about, uh, let's see, a little over 0.24 G's, maybe a little more than that even. The braking acceleration is pretty impressive. The braking acceleration going back goes down to about, oh, let's see, not even a whole G, but about 0.8 or so. And so this is, this is an important thing, right? And that's how the, the performance is being measured here. Now, if you get the chance, watch the White Zombie electric car. It's pretty interesting, but I think you've already seen it from a previous class. Now, in our case, we're going to change things a little bit. You understand the idea, hopefully, of performance and efficiency as desired output over required input. But there's a problem because if one of the most common ways that you'll measure efficiency is your fuel economy. It's miles per gallon. But that's kind of problematic because miles and gallons don't really get at what we want. What we'd like to do is have something that's dimensionless. Now there's plenty of other examples you could think of. For example, I realized when I was working on my house it's better just to hire someone to work on the drywall because I'm not very good at it. And so my performance as a drywall finisher or hanger or whatever the case may be would be area finished per week. Maybe the way I get projects done it should have been measured as area finished per month or per year in some cases. Uh, but my performance is not particularly high, so it made more sense to hire someone to do the work for me. But we need thermal efficiency that doesn't involve these units. We need efficiency and performance that are dimensionless. So the same units for the, the numerator as we have for the denominator. So for a, a heat engine, it's really the network output, which could be energy, divided by the total heat input. So again, energy. Or it could be the net power output, which would be power, divided by the rate of heat input. Either one of those would be just fine for our performance or efficiency measurement. So now we can quantify very particularly the uh, efficiency of a heat engine. So the thermal efficiency then will be defined as the network out over the heat in. Now, since we could draw a, uh, a system boundary around the heat engine, we know that the network out is the difference in the heat flow, so we can replace the network out with the difference of the heat flows, Qn minus Q out, and then write it another way, one minus Q out over Qn. That's just as valid as network out over Qn. Be careful. This is only something that we will consider for heat engines, right? Thermal efficiency only goes with heat engines. You can't talk about the thermal efficiency of a refrigerator, for example. That doesn't make sense because thermal efficiency is work over heat. On the other hand, if you're thinking of a refrigerator and you want to quantify its efficiency, well, then that's going to be desired output, which is, in the case of a refrigerator, pumping heat out of a compartment, so heat flow, divided by the power you have to put in, right, or, or the work you have to put in. So it's sort of a reverse of this. So don't try to talk about thermal efficiency in the context of a heat pump or a refrigerator. It doesn't make any sense there. Thermal efficiency just goes with heat engines. So here are the equations we have, and if you understand all this, great. If you don't, it's okay. These are the equations you need for heat engines, and I would recommend you go to the back of the book now, or the back of the chapter, and make a note of these equations. We will use them extensively in this chapter. Now, along the way, you might have noticed that we're throwing away energy, and you might say, well, you know, I don't like the fact that I go to the gas pump, and now that you've told me it's a heat engine, it's throwing energy away that I've paid for. Well, I don't like it either. So is there some way that we could save it? So let's think of a very simple heat engine and see if we can find a way to save the waste heat. So if we have a reservoir at 100 degrees Celsius and we transfer 100 kilojoules into a gas that begins at 30 degrees Celsius so that it can lift a load, say doing 15 kilojoules worth of work, we're still going to have a whole lot of energy left behind. There's this thermal energy in the gas at 90 degrees Celsius. And once the load is removed, I don't really want to build another elevator to lift the next load, right? That's not efficient. It would be better to reuse the one I have, in other words, to operate it on a cycle. The only way I can do that is by cooling the gases. I've got to cool the gases down to 30 degrees Celsius, or they won't shrink, and the, the piston won't come back down to lift the next load. And if I do work on it, pushing the gas down, guess how much work I'll have to do? If you guessed 15 kilojoules, you're right. Now. If I take a 
a thermal energy reservoir that's at a lower temperature, say 20 degrees Celsius, I should be able to extract the, the waste thermal energy, which would be 85 kilojoules worth, and throw it away into the lower temperature reservoir. And that would allow me to operate on a cycle, but here I am throwing away energy. But how could we avoid it? There's no way to avoid it because we have to get the system back to where it started. It's not efficient to build a new system over and over and over again. So we can't avoid Q out. There's just no way if we want our engine to operate on a cycle. Could we somehow recycle, right? Recycling's a big thing. Let's recycle the waste energy back into the 100 degrees Celsius reservoir. Well, that won't work. The gas is at 90 degrees. If you connect that to the 100 degree reservoir again, what's going to happen is heat's going to flow from the reservoir into our, uh, our engine and things will be even worse. So this is not good. This, this won't work. There's no way to save QL, the, the waste heat. We have to throw it away. So some people would have the idea that, you know, this power plant you showed us earlier, it doesn't make sense because you're boiling off the steam. Why can't we leave that in the gas phase once it goes through the turbine and not condense it and throw away QL and make this system more efficient? Well, that won't work because a pump can't pump vapor, and it turns out that if you put a compressor there instead, you'll use up all the work produced by the turbine, or at least the majority of it. It won't be near as efficient. Turns out it's actually more efficient to throw out QL in that case. Again, we'll see this later in the course. So the thermal efficiency being less than one is due to the fact that there's some Q out, right? That Q out over Q in term, that fraction, is not zero, so it subtracts from that the one at the beginning of the equation, the, the ideal 100% efficiency. And the interesting thing about this is that this less than 100% efficiency is not due to friction, right? It, we didn't say anything about there being any friction anywhere. All we said was to get the system back where it started, you have to throw away some waste energy, some low quality, in other words, low temperature energy. So this less than 100% efficiency has nothing to do with friction. So finally we get to the second law and the Kelvin Planck statement of that law. What they said is that it is impossible for any device that operates on a cycle to receive heat from a single reservoir and produce a net amount of work. They said that can't be done. So this is what both of these uh, people uh, postulated. And so we can't make engines that pull in thermal energy only and just convert it all completely into work.